Okay, let me know if it's not uh, big enough or something. I'll write the title. We'll start with that. And if you can't read it, then uh, this is a problem. Okay. So. OK, sorry. I needed to have this. Uh, OK, so I'm a phone so This is joint work with uh, Tim Kuniski and Alex Wine, who are working with me at NYU. What I'll talk about is uh, statistical to computational gaps, in particular in our hypothesis testing. I'll talk about a different method than what we're used to seeing on the heuristics that come from motivated from physics, known as the low degree method. And for this audience, I thought I should highlight the power of this method by saying something uh, about the uh, hardness of certifying certain bounds on the Sheraton Kirkpatrick model. Okay, so I've been, my main interest these days has been really in trying to understand what, what kind of statistical estimation problems or hypothesis testing or optimization on random landscapes have uh, computational gaps on average. So for which problems do we know that it should be possible to solve? if we had uh, unlimited computational time, but with restricted computation, say in polynomial time, linear time with efficient methods, we really believe there's some fundamental difficulty to solving them. As, uh, right, as, as we get more and more data, bigger and bigger data sets, these limits should really correspond to, the, to sort of the real information limits and the real uh, limits for what can be done in, uh, in statistics, data science, and so on. Okay. And I, since I got interested in these fields exactly because of papers from a few of you in the audience, who I learned from some of the heuristics coming from statistical physics and some of the ideas that you could actually make incredible predictions about what can and can't be done and, uh, efficiently, I've been exploring other ways of trying to come up with, uh, with these predictions. And I'm going to talk about today something sort of informally known as the low degree method which comes motivated a bit more from the algebra and the theoretical computer science and uh, maybe real algebraic geometry, very related to the so-called sum of squares hierarchy. Okay, so I'm gonna split the talk uh, into two parts. The second part, I'll talk about hypothesis testing and so on. The first, I'll present the problem about the sheraton kirkpatrick model that, I can, uh, that we can say something about, okay? And then afterwards, I'll I'll sort of reduce it to a hypothesis testing problem and I'll explain how we, how we say something about that problem. Okay, so let's say, okay, so let me introduce the, the Sheraton Kirkpatrick. I better not misspell anyone's name. <laughs> okay. Okay, my interest from it is, is a little different. From, okay, so I'll, Okay, let me write it this way. So this is just the Hamiltonian. I usually write my, my random matrices as W, as in they are a Wigner matrix. All right, so what I mean by this, I can write it as it's drawn from a GOE, or just the entries WIJ are Gaussians. The matrix is N by N, and it's symmetric. And so this is the Sheraton Patrick Hamiltonian. I think of it, what, the way that I'm interested in it is I want to optimize this function. I want to minimize this over, right, so I want to minimize over x in the hypercube. So 
one can study, right, and in statistical physics, one studies uh, properties of this Hamiltonian, associated Gibbs distribution, and so on. What I'm interested in is I'm interested in understanding the optimization problem of minimizing this random function over the hypercube, right? This, in the language of physics, I'm interested in understanding something about the ground state of this Hamiltonian. Okay. And, uh, and so we know, okay, so we know from the work of Parisi in around the 80s and of Talagrand in, I think, 2006. This minimum converges to the so-called Parisi number. Okay, so for the sake of this talk, we'll think about this as minus 1.5. Okay, I mean, give or take. Okay, so what... So let's see. So I have a random function, right? The function, the weights are random. And I know that in the limit, the minimum of this random function lies at minus, around minus 1.5, right? This function, in theory at least, is hard to optimize because it's, uh, it's over integers. Essentially, it's a discrete thing. It's non-convex and all these things. And I want to know, does this pose, uh, is it easy to optimize this function from, say, a computer science and optimization viewpoint? So let me uh, just define another object just to make things a little easier. Okay, so I'm just going to write uh, G as the ground state corresponding to the matrix W, just exactly this quantity. Okay, so now from the algorithmic viewpoint, my interest in this is understanding algorithm hardness of, of problems associated with this random function. There are sort of two main problems. Okay? Maybe one is more natural and the other one might, uh, might uh, at first glance not appear as natural and it's the one I'm gonna talk about, so let me try to motivate it. And please ask questions if, uh, if you don't feel has been motivated enough because I, I can give more, uh, more evidence of why one should care about it. And this is the good thing with board talks. I can detour as, uh, yeah. It looked like it was like prepared like that all along. Okay, so one natural question is the question of search, right? So what do I mean by the question of search? I mean, given the matrix W drawn from the GOE, okay, this just means the matrix W drawn according to distributions, right? The goal would be find some vector x hat. such that such that my objective is as small as possible right so i get drawn the matrix i now come up with whatever procedure random or not it gives me an x hat and i evaluate its objective this way Right? Now, the output of the algorithm is for sure random because the matrix itself is random. And now I can ask how well do I do in, uh, how well do I do on average or with high probability? Okay, so we know since very recently that uh, search has no computational gap. Okay, so, so let me, uh, yeah, so. Okay, this is due to Montanari maybe last year, I think. And uh, it's based on ideas also from, uh, from a paper on optimization of uh, full RSV models. I won't describe what these things are, but uh, by Eliran Subag in the same year. Okay, so what do I mean by this? 
is that there exists, can you still read if I write here or should I go? One more line is okay? okay. Is that there exists, or okay, let me be maybe a little more precise. Okay, for any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an efficient algorithm that given w finds x such that um, let's call it x hat or I should go say bigger okay let me be a bit more smaller recall than okay so I don't know if it's still visible is it visible here okay so what am I what does this mean this means that th this problem, even though it corresponds, you know, to a, certainly an NP-hard problem over any type of, uh, of model that we have for worst case problems, the search has no computational gap. Meaning that if I give you W, there is an algorithm that for any value of epsilon can find, uh, can find a configuration hypercube, can find X such that the value of the Hamiltonian for that X is arbitrarily close to the actual ground, ground state. All of these, uh, all of these claims are in the large end limit, right? There's all, all of this is sort of with high probability and in the large end limit type of claims, but everything can be made precise. But as n goes to infinity, everything concentrates extremely well, so you can just think of all this stuff as equalities. Okay, so the problem I'm interested in is slightly different, and it's the problem of certification. So I want to give lower bounds to the ground state. Okay, so let me see if I can define this in a way that it's intuitive. And please, if it's not clear what I mean here, ask questions. I'm happy to clarify. This is sort of the, the most important part. Okay, so what is a, a lower bound? Let's call it F of W is the following. Okay, let me write this in a different way, maybe. Given W, okay, I have a lower bound FW such that F of W needs to be smaller or equal Okay, I mean, so far I haven't done really anything, right? I'm just sort of defining what a lower bound is. Okay, a certificate uh, or let me call it a certification of B, of a lower bound of B is a function F of W that is a lower bound, right? So it's a function F of W such that F W is a lower bound. Okay. F of W is smaller or equal than B with high probability. Okay. And F is, if, is uh, efficient to compute. Okay, so this is worth taking a second to, to digest. So I have this random function, right? I have the random function G of W. I want now a lower bound for it. So G of W is in general not easy to compute. I want a lower bound of it as a certification of a lower bound that satisfies the following properties. It needs to be a lower bound always, right? This inequality needs to hold for all matrices W. It can't just be with high probability. It needs to, of course, be below my lower bound, my, my actual uh, certification value with high probability. And I need to compute it efficiently. 
Okay, so let me give you an example. Maybe I'll go here. Okay, a lower bound to a very sort of trivial lower bound to this quantity is just replacing the hypercube by a sphere. Right? I can just take I can make this my f of w. Okay. Is it clear to everyone why this is always a lower bound? Right? Before I was in hypercube, now I'm in the sphere, larger space, I'm minimizing something for sure this quantity will be smaller. And it is a lower bound not just with high probability over Gaussian matrices, it's a lower bound always. Right? And so now to understand what kind of certificate this gives, one needs to understand what is the value of this with high probability, right? But so now, okay, now we're getting again with the high probability in the sort of the high probability regime. So we're back to the fact that uh, W is drawn from a GOE, right? This quantity, well, okay, and it is easy to compute, right? Because this is just an eigenvalue. It's just a small eigenvalue of the matrix W. Okay, so this, this is exactly the minimum eigenvalue of W, and we know that this goes to minus two, right? Maybe two, two. It's probably already in Wigner's work, I think. Okay. Yes? Yeah, please. So in this case, uh, the B would correspond to minus two. Wait, did I? Oh, because I, I think always I'm maximizing, but for the physics audience, I replaced everything. It's possible that I replaced everything except one in one place. Yeah, yeah, of course, right, okay, sorry. Yeah, right. I always think the other way, and I didn't flip all the signs. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in reality, it will be just always equal to B. OK, so is it clear how this provides a certification of minus 2? Right? If I have a matrix drawn from the GOE, and uh, this is always a lower bound on the ground state of the shannon patrick model, and the value of the lower bound will be minus 2. I mean, as n goes to infinity, it concentrates extremely quickly to minus two. Okay, and so a natural question that a uh, few of us asked ourselves a few years ago is can one do better than this? So there's a few reasons of why this is an interesting question. Perhaps the most natural is that one of the ways to try to understand computational hardness, not only on average case, but to some extent even of approximation and so on, one of the, one of the very popular techniques in our computer science is uh, convex relaxations. And in particular, some of squares hierarchy and things of this type. And those techniques always work by certifying. They always work by relaxing to a so-called convex relaxation, which is sort of exactly what's happening here, too. Right? And so understanding the limits of such techniques, in particular, one needs to know if, if certification is not possible, then those two techniques already have a sort of a fundamental issue they need to deal with. Okay? And the other side is that it, we, if, if there is a, if there is a computational gap, it's sort of one of a slightly different nature that should be better understood. Okay, and so our, our conditional theorem, I mean, it's as most things with uh, you know, computational complexity, it's conditional on something. But our conditional theorem is that this is unimprovable. 
Okay, so let me try the, to write the conditional theorem in as precise way as I can. Yes. From, and the value, yes. Right, the gap between, uh, right, so maybe a way to draw this would be, right, we have the actual ground state around uh, minus 1.5. We know that search can actually get arbitrarily close. So there is no computational gap in the sense of finding good solutions, but there is a, or we believe there is a fundamental gap in the sense of certification. And that above two is unimprovable with fast algorithms. Okay? So the theorem that we prove, okay, I'll, I'll do it a little informally. Is the following. Okay, conditional on low degree conjecture, which I'll, I'll describe when I talk about hypothesis testing. Okay, for any. For any epsilon bigger than zero, it is not possible Let me process this. So what the theorem says, conditional in this, uh, you know, in this conjecture that I'll describe at least informally, then uh, our claim is that for any epsilon, right, so where the epsilon is just here, right, this is uh, now minus two minus epsilon, right, for any epsilon here, it is impossible to provide a certificate in this notion of certificate that certifies a bound, right, that is strictly better than two in time essentially less than exponential, right? I mean, this, uh, this two to the n to the point nine 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 is just because, you know, the, these techniques are not quite precise enough to tell, uh, to really, really say exponential, but they get as close. Of course, this nine 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 can be transformed into any number, right? So essentially, it's not only that it's not polynomial time, it will essentially take you, you know, exponential time. You might as well just try all the, the points on the hypercube, and then, of course, you have a certificate because uh, right, you just tried everything. Although it's maybe worth saying that I, I still believe that even if I gave you two to the n time, you could try everything. If you still had to convince me of a certificate that I could check in polynomial time, I still think this is impossible. But that's a lot harder to, to, to show because it's a lot harder to make uh, you know, formal. Okay, so where is the... Okay, so how do we do something like this? I guess maybe this is a good point. Is it clear what the statement says? How much time do I have, sorry? And how much should I leave for questions? 18. Okay, all right. All right, so this is a problem on which the phenomena of how hard it is to search for a solution and how hard it is to convince someone that there's no better one seems to be very, very different from the computational viewpoint. Okay, so how do we do this? I'll try to uh, almost show the proof in uh, 10 minutes and then leave some time for questions. Okay, so we reduce to hypothesis testing. And then use and develop a technique to, to try to argue that hypothesis testing is computationally hard. Okay, and so how do we, how do we reduce to hypothesis testing? Okay, so 
the whole idea is in coming up with a distribution, W prime, that is drawn from some, let's call it T, some tamper distribution. Okay, so I create a new distribution of matrices. Right, let's call this T, this distribution I tampered with it in some way. And I now draw W prime from it. And this distribution has the following property that, uh, do I still have on the board G of W? Yeah, maybe I'll just, it has the property that with high probability, the minimum is essentially two. Okay, I'll just write it like this to not, uh, to not have to go with, uh, you know. I'm drawing a distribution of matrices from some other distribution. It's not, of course, the GOE, such that with high probability, the ground state for this matrix is actually very close to minus two. Okay? Think uh, smaller recall. I mean, if we can want to be precise, you can just think of it as smaller recall than two minus epsilon, right? But essentially two. Okay, so I have this object. And the claim is that doing a hypothesis testing between um, what statisticians call H0 or the computer science call distribution Q is that depending on the, you know, on which community you belong to, where W is drawn from the GOE, and H1, or the computer scientist is called P, W prime was drawn from, or W was drawn from T, is computationally hard. Okay, so let me now explain this in words again. I have a new distribution. It is no longer, right, it's still the same Hamiltonian, but now with weights W or J in the, in the notation of statistical physics that do not come from a Gaussian, right? I built them in some other way. And I do it so that the ground state actually is minus two, right? So now it's a completely different problem in which there is a, a hole down in the landscape where the value is actually minus two. And I claim that I do it what we call quietly or hiddenly or, or depending on which community you belong to, you might call it different things. But I do it in a way that distinguishing if the weights came from the real GOE distribution or if it came from this tamper distribution, I believe is computationally hard. Uh-huh. Oh, you mean if I want to understand what the gap is for the worst case matrix W? I think I can do, so this then becomes, it's a question in, uh, that theory computer science has looked at for some years on approximation algorithms and so on. And the setting is, is completely different. In particular, I believe I can create gaps of, of order log n in that setting. Right, so here the statement is different. It's, the matrix is, uh, you know, I. I get a matrix uh, W, I compute a lower bound for it. it, it just needs to be a lower bound for any matrix, such as the minimum eigenvalue of W. It needs to be something that you compute and is for sure a lower bound. But then, uh, the way you evaluate how good your lower bound is, is still on average with respect to the GOE. Right, the minus two comes from understanding what the minimum eigenvalue is when the matrix is drawn from the GOE. So it's still average case the lower bound you build needs to always be a lower bound in the same way that the search, right, when you do search, you're effectively finding an upper bound on the ground state. And regardless of how good your search is or how bad your matrix is, it will always be an upper bound on the ground state. This is always a lower bound on the ground state in that way, 
But then I evaluate the lower bound with, on the measure, on the random measure. So it's still a statement about average complexity in that sense. Is it more clear? Yes. Yes, but it is only minus 2 if W is typical. Right? Otherwise, I could come up with W as minimum eigenvalue is, you know, minus log n or, or anything. So it's true that the minimum eigenvalue is always a lower bound, but it only is a lower bound of value minus 2 under the measure of the GOE. And the statement is about how no procedure can do better than this. No, no, okay, so this, uh, so what I mean by this is you get drawn, okay, so let me see if I explain the reduction. Here might not help to write very much. I'm going to explain what I mean by the reduction. I mean that you get one sample from W or one sam a single sample, so one, just one matrix, or you get a sample from uh, what I'm calling W prime, so T, right? I mean, this is a bit of abuse of notation, but right. I get a sample of GOE or I get a sample of this temper distribution. I say even, I drew it with probability half from one bag, half from the other. I give you one of them, and I ask you, okay, make a, an intelligent guess of which, whether this came from the GOE or came from the temper distribution, and the claim is that this is computationally hard. In the limit of very large matrices. In the limit of very large matrices. Yeah, you have, you have low on the no, okay, so, okay, so why not? Because, in the sense of statistics, or in the sense of information theory, in the sense of, of distance between distributions, these distributions are very, very different. Because if you had unlimited computational power, you just go ahead and compute the ground state. It will be around minus 1.5 here, it will be minus 2 here. They'll concentrate incredibly fast. And so you just say, okay, my statistical test will be, is the ground state above or below 1.7? And this statistical test will have incredible power. The point is that this statistical test is not something that one can do in polynomial time, we believe. And the claim is that there is no statistical test that can be done quickly, say in polynomial time or even, I mean, more ambitiously in time 2 to the n or something, that is able to do this task. Uh huh. No, so it shouldn't, right? Because otherwise that, that contradicts the theorem and therefore this proves the conjecture, the low degree conjecture, which I might not have time to explain, but it's okay. So, so what, what we expect happens then, if I run the search algorithm, let's say I'd run uh, like Andrea's Montanari's algorithm on, on both W and W prime. Because this is a polynomial time procedure, its statistics should be exactly the same in W or W prime. So what it will do in W prime is it will also find a ground state, or, or not a ground state, but it will find something that is very close to minus 1.5. And it will completely miss the fact that somewhere else in space there's a huge basin of minus 2 that is just hidden. It will still, like Andrea's algorithm will still work here, but it will work at finding something of the value minus 1.5, not of finding the true ground state for this model. Is it more clear? Yes, but even the statement is stronger in the sense that even a global view, as long as you don't give yourself exponential time to compute, right? So what one means by local and global and, right, of course, I don't actually prove, right? P proving that things take exponential time, we, we have no, essentially no way of doing it. But condition in a certain conjecture, if you believe that conjecture, it says that no procedure that, uh, that is efficient can do this. Okay, so maybe I'll, this is the most fun talk I've ever given, yeah. Uh, no? It is constructive. I wasn't going to give you the recipe because uh, I think it's more interesting to see how one argues that this is computationally hard. But the recipe is actually quite simple and I don't think you learn much from it. You essentially rotate the GOE to point in a random hypercube point. That, that's, all it, that's all it does. Okay, there was an... Mm -hmm. 
There'll be some, but there'll be very few. I mean, there'll be the ones, I mean, at least intuitively speaking, I just planted an hypercube point down in the bottom. Anything that correlates positively with that hypercube point is gaining traction. And so there'll be sort of a cone of solutions that, inter that interacts uh, con like as a constant overlap with the, with the planted thing. So there'll be some, but they'll be, they'll be restricted to an exponentially small part of the space. Now, okay, so one thing that maybe I should, uh, even if I said this already, I should say again, which is why this is actually a proper reduction, right? So for those who have seen it, who've uh, seen this already, sorry, for, for, but I think it's maybe good to say it again, right? If, if uh, I had a way of certifying a lower bound that does better than minus two, then this task that I just gave the audience of I take things from a bag and ask you which one came from which would become quite easy because if I drew you something from the GOE, you would just run that magical procedure that certifies a lower bound better than minus two. And if it does, then for sure, you are not in the tempered distribution. Therefore, you just say, yeah, you're in the GOE. And otherwise, you would say, no, I'm in the tempered distribution. So the problem of hypothesis testing here Right? is a reduction to the other one. If you, could do, uh, if you could do certification, you could also do hypothesis testing. This problem is strictly easier than the one of certifying better than minus two. What do you mean? Oh, yeah. So I think here of as n goes to infinity, I want all the power to go to one. So the, 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 the hypothesis testing needs to be done, uh, you know, with probability of failure going to zero. Because that would be, if I want a certificate that certifies with, prob with high probability, this would be the sort of the right equivalence. Yeah. Okay. What I'm saying is, if you use alternative ways, so, uh, one compiler based assignment, for example, asymptotically, like, if you test Yeah, but here the claim, the, here the claim is, if you have a procedure, that given a matrix W produces a lower bound that is with high probability better than minus two, right? Then in the definition I gave of hypothesis testing, this would be an algorithm to perform a hypothesis testing in my definition of doing it. And I argue, prove conditionally, that this way of doing hypothesis testing is computationally hard. Therefore, it is also computationally hard to do this, right? It's a mathematical formula, yeah. Okay, all right. So now, can I, five minutes with, que with questions or? I see, all right, but uh, this is the best part. I'm happy to have more, so let's see. Um, okay, I'll try to describe the low degree method in, uh, in five minutes, and if anyone wants to see the calculations, come talk to me offline or I can send you some references, because these calculations are actually not hard to do at all. I mean, it would take me maybe another 30 minutes and I could sort of do the whole thing, but uh, you can, I'm happy to show it offline or send you some references. Okay, so what's the idea with the low degree method? All right, so let's see how I can. Okay, so this goes back I mean, depending, uh, it's hard to see in the literature where this uh, showed up the first time because it depends how explicitly it was described. But I think sort of the consensus is that this was in some form or another in uh, Barak et al. in 16, and then made a bit more precise in uh, Sam, Sam Hopkins and Dave Storer work in 17, and another paper with uh, subsets of the union of those authors and again in 17. And then some more specific conjectures were made in Sam Hopkins' thesis. And we worked out some, uh, we, we made some slightly different conjectures. We worked out some um, ways of, um, some ways of making these computations and sort of survey the whole thing uh, in a survey that is available on my page, okay? And the idea is the following. So let's say I have right, hypothesis testing, okay? And I'm gonna use the, 
the Q versus P sort of notation. Okay, so Q you should think of H0, P of H1. So I get a sample from one or the other, and I just want a procedure to tell me if I receive the sample from Q or a sample from P, right? Sample from W or a sample from W prime. Okay. So, so sort of optimal ways of doing this, they go back to the work of Neiman and Pearson in the 30s. Okay, so this goes back to the work of Neiman, and maybe even before, but some, sometime in the 30s, right? And what they say is the optimal test, okay, so let, let me write maybe this. So Y came from Q versus a, a random variable Y coming from P. And they say the optimal test is given by the so-called likelihood ratio. Okay, so the optimal test is given by thresholding the following object. I mean, of course, P needs to be absolutely continuous with respect to Q and so on. I'm putting a bit of that under the rug. Right? But the optimal test is given by the likelihood ratio. What I mean by the optimal test is if you fix sort of a, you know, there's the type one and type two error, the false positive, false negative errors. If you fix one, you want to sort of minimize the other. And so there's a whole family of tests for each one you fix of the first one. And the whole family of tests is obtained by different thresholdings of this function. Right? So if this function is very high, it means the likelihood and their P is very high, and then their Q should be much smaller. Therefore, you're probably in P. If this likelihood ratio is very small, you're probably in their Q. Right, this is the density or the likelihood and so on. Okay, so there's another way of thinking about this, which I don't think is how Neiman and Pearson thought about it, but it's, more, it's easier to do what I'm gonna do next, is that this function is optimal also in an L2 sense. So what I mean by this is this function is the one that maximizes the following. If I wanna maximize my expectation under P, subject to being, having bounded variance under Q, okay, so now I'm just turning things into L2 so that I can use inner products and projections and so on, right? So now I'm doing, I mean, it's not usually how we think of optimality in hypothesis testing, but turns out it's equivalent in this case, that uh, what I want to do is I want a function that with, with expectation if the data was drawn from P is very large in expectation, and its variance is controlled if I draw it from Q. Okay, so this now is a lot nicer thing to, to deal with. I mean, the Neiman Pearson lemma is also easy to prove, but this now becomes sort of a trivial fact in linear algebra. Okay. Right, so now I just do a change of variables. I just did a change of variables, right? But now what is this? This is just the expected value of the likelihood ratio times f of y. Okay. If I think of the natural L2 inner product in the measure of L2 of q, right? Another way to write this Sorry for that. The, the time constraints is making me have to go through the algebra a little fast. Right? If I think the natural inner product over L2 of Q, right, is just the expected value of F times G, right, then what I have there is I'm maximizing. But this is a trivial thing to do in linear algebra, right? The optimum is just the L normalized to have norm one, right? So the optimum function is 
right? Right? I mean, okay. And moreover, the optimum, like the value, the value of the optimum is just given by the L2 norm of L. Okay. Maybe this is not as important. Okay, so now the likelihood ratio, L, is optimum also in this L2 sense. Right. And uh, do I have, sorry, sorry for, do I have, to, can I take three more minutes? Is that okay? Or, okay. So the optimum is given by L. Now, uh, Lacombe in the 60s tells us that, so the ideas of contiguity and so on, so Lacombe in the 60s or even 1960 said, said that in order to see if hypothesis testing is possible or not in the limit, a good way of looking at, a good way of testing it, or a, a condition to see if hypothesis testing is possible or not is to take the expectation over Q of the del 2 norm of the likelihood ratio, okay? And essentially what he shows is that if, if this is finite, as n grows to infinity, then uh, hy uh, hypothesis testing with, uh, with full power is impossible. The proof of this theorem is uh, Really, really nice uh, two-line uh, use of Cauchy-Schwarz that I don't have time to do. But uh, it showed that if this is bounded, then hypothesis testing is impossible. Okay? So the whole idea of the low degree method, this comes motivated from the sum of squares hierarchy, which comes motivated from things like the positive Stellensatz and Hilbert's new Stellensatz and so on, is that a natural way to, do, to look at these things in a computationally bounded way is to restrict our attention to low degree polynomials to polynomials of degree up to log n for technical reasons. And then the natural question is, what if instead of asking for the best possible function, I ask for the best possible function in this sense, restricted to low degree polynomials, right? So I add another restriction that f is low degree. Because low degree polynomials are a subspace of L2 of Q, all I'm doing is I'm taking projection on the subspace. So the optimum here becomes simply the projection of the likelihood ratio on low degree polynomials. And then the low degree method or the conjecture is that we should do exactly what Lacombe told us to do, but with the projection of this, of this test and not with the test itself. Because it's a projection, computing norms of projections is just computing inner products with basis functions, which in the cases of Gaussians just correspond to integrals of Hermit polynomials that are actually quite easy to do. And therefore, we can actually compute this explicitly or almost explicitly and understand when is it that it's bounded or not in this computationally restricted sense of low degree polynomials. Okay, I'm happy to talk more about this offline or answer any questions. Sorry for the extra. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.